Well, there is all kinds of hula. And as we're looking at laka in association with mahu, there's all kinds of hula. And, and there's some hulas that are very um, gendered. Female, male, hardline. There's some halal that's still like that. If you're male, you have to dance like this. You have to look like this. And, and you know, so that's that kind. And that's great we have that. But beyond that, there's always, hula has always been a place. Hula, not necessarily the halal. Hula has always been a place where mahus were somewhat accepted. It was a safe place. Um, this is where our soft boys could get up and dance, you know, and, and, and so because we value entertainment, you know, so we were, you know, we, um, we had a place, we had a function in society. And then as the halal system had started to reawaken in the 70s and the 80s, meaning we're getting out of the hula studio generation and we're now reforming ourselves as halal, bringing back the older traditions, some of us going as far as bringing back the kuahu with the laka, um, the physical embodiments of it. And we were one of those halals, halal kekuhi. Um, so, you know, the hula has, even in halal kekuhi, um, we have a number of mahus. We didn't have trans um, mahus. Not that I can remember, not in my time. But, you know, we had a number of um, gay people in Halal, and it didn't matter. It was a safe place. For me as a child, um, me being in Hula, nobody questioned my masculinity. Now, outside of Hula, you had all these mores you had to follow as a male, as an eldest ch male child. And so you get ostracized there, but in hula, you, you become a celebrity. So it became a safe place. So as laka is related to the mahu, I am not sure what that is other than we don't, we don't underscore the gender. You dance. And we rarely ever have a dance only where the guys dance and the when guys, this is the man's dance and this is the woman's dance. So that somebody like Stacy would have to go, well, where do I dance? We just dance everything and we dance, the women dance like men and the men dance like women. We just dance. So it was a place where you wouldn't get assessed. I mean, you get, you get assessed on how well you can dance, not what gender you are. And so, for, and that's when Stacy came to Unukupu Kupu and that Kuwa was established because, and I did have other Mahu transgendered students in, in our program, not much, but I needed to make sure that, and of course the university, you have to make sure it's, you know, safe and, and, and diverse, you know, all of those federal regulations, but I don't need federal regulations to, to teach me how to respect the human person, no matter how they're hardwired and they're, desi and they're designed. And so I needed to make sure that the hula that I was creating was overtly a safe place for all kinds of people. And um, and that's the laka that Stacy has been trained. She might have other laka kinds of relationship, but in as I am related to her, the laka that I brought to her or she came to was a, a place where you didn't have to choose. You're going to dance like a man or a lady. Um, you dance however you wanted that, even costuming. I mean, I, I, I'm, I don't come from where all the costuming has to be. Some people don't want to show parts of their body. 
So, well, I don't care. Just that. Let's figure something out. Some people don't want, till today, they don't want to show their arms or some of the men don't want to wear malo because they have this phobia about wearing malo. They feel that they're too fat and they don't look like the Mary Monarch studs on the stage. And, and I said, well, then don't wear a malo. Let's wear something else. So I was able to really create a world where people can just dance and leave all of that, that, that baggage that obstructs the spirit from dancing. Leave it on this road right over here so when the cars come by, the cars can run it over. That's how you should tell them, leave your ego on that road and when the cars come by, they'll run it over and, and you'll be all better. And, um, but that's the laka that I brought. We all have an opportunity to design a laka. Laka does not come fixed, we design her. Laka is the enlightenment and it's embodied in certain botanicals, um, minerals, you know, certain phenomena, but it's enlightenment. So, you know, Laka is not, she's not hard, hard defined. That's my definition of Laka. My wife have, may have a different one. The, the Laka that I come from you know, I descend from it, but my teachers had a different definition, you know, not too different. But I, so long my students respected the space and respected each other, that, that meant they respected. That's laka. That's the laka. They have a love. And so that's maybe the, the laka that Stacy is speaking about. Now we have 40,000 gods, so I'm sure there's like at least 2,000 lakas. So, but that's the laka I bring, and that's the laka I know Stacy to know. Um, it is, and maybe that's why she can see herself in laka. Isn't that great? Yeah. When you can see yourself in the god, yeah. Yeah. and the god can see themselves in you. We don't want you to always look at it. At one point, it has to be embodied. And so, um, so she's, she's nailed it. Laka is in her, and that's what it is. We don't, again, our Judeo Christian world sometimes conditions us to see God always outside of us. That doesn't work for some of us. And it didn't work for me. Um, I, I, I still subscribe to some of that, but I also know that it has to be inside of me. And so, that's the beauty that Stacy has, and she's unapologetic about that. And sometimes a little tart in her opinions. <laughs> but it's her opinions, and she has them. And the thing is, she doesn't mind learning, and she's, she is a service to our community. And all those other Mahu kids, to have a Mahu Hula teacher who is respected by the community. You know what used to be, you know what became of people like Stacy in the 60s and in the 50s and the 40s? Horrible monstrosities that used to happen to them. And now she's one of our huge cultural leaders. Mm -hmm. That's my little girl. Um, so, as it regards Stacy out on my student, um, at the time I invited her to join the cohort of our hula graduates who were selected to become a, a generation of hula teachers. So that's, that's not something you pay tuition for. That's outside of that. It's a, so it's a life learning um, program that I have. It's actually indigenous leadership through hula is the, the program. That cohort is called Uno Le Hua. Whenever I, I identify people to train um, to become Kumuhula, um, you know, that's called Uno Le Hua. Um, Stacy was um, my hairdresser and she's my wife's cousin. And she was also a student here, an early student, and she was still a man. And um, and in fact, she was going through our hula program here, and then in our in our third semester course, we had a community hoike. She did. She told me, and we we all knew she was mahu, and she told me, "I'm gonna come in wahine." For it. so she was preparing. Yeah, I mean, she came to school as a man, 
But this was the first time that she was letting us see this other side of her. So she came to Hoike, the community event, dressed in a mumu, and, and, and you know, she's just beautiful. She's a handsome man and a beautiful woman. So she was quite stunning. And um, again, we didn't know she was mahu. So, but that was her academic rearing here on the campus. And then she, there was a, a separation of time, and she went to work as a hairdresser and, and of course that she would do my hair and I just so happened to open up a cohort and I looked at her now I, I didn't know much of her at the time but there was something and I didn't know what her potential was um, I did know she was very Hawaiian and I did know that she was the kind of Hawaiian that relished esoteric connections. So not just the surface, um, you know, topical Hawaiian, but she really wanted, she was very curious about that part of our culture that was largely asleep. And so for that reason, I've always known that of her, for that reason, um, I invited her and again, there's still a large number of our community, our Hawaiians, that are still very uncomfortable. Um, they're not practicing Christians, but there's this deep residual. And you have to respect that. I respect that too. But Stacy was not of that sort. So I invited her, and she came in. Um, and we danced, I'm not sure for how many years. And she was just always there. She's just great and energetic. She's my kind of learner. She's just. Um, not afraid of learning, not afraid of trying. You know, she's like, she's probably one of, I mean, I have to look at the core. She's probably the most skilled in creating the material arts pieces of our culture. But there was a time when we're getting to Uniki. And Uniki is when we're preparing to debut all of our learning in front of the Kumuhulas, a panel. And it's, it, it does induce ulcers. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's easier get to get a doctoral degree than it is to go through a hula uniki. And then because we, I descend from a very stringent school, of, you know, a traditional, what people will call a traditional school, where there's many kinds of traditions, but ours was steep in a ritual. So um, there was always that layer. The, the gods were in the room. So it's not like it's just a secular uh, hula debut. You know, it was the gods are in the room. And then I moved their graduation a year up, so that just caused more anxiety. I just said, no. I, before I start seeing things wrong, <laughs> out of place, let's end on a high note. And that was my line, let's end on a high note. Because when you keep the student for too long, then the seeds of that, the seeds can't grow. There's, you're supposed to keep them for a period of time, then you need our chance they cast the seed so it grows. But when you keep the student too long, then what become what was sacred and loving begins to take another form. It begins to take passion becomes obligation. And the sacrifice is not the same. And so I said, Oh no, I could see people are getting fatigued. And I said, okay, we're gonna end on a high note, we're ending a year early. Well, of course now I'm getting very I'm preparing them this one year razor, laser sharp, you know. And I'm a kind teacher, but now I'm, I'm, I'm still kind, but I'm being very specific. And I realized that um, I've sort of sensed that she's very, very vulnerable because she's Mahu. Now at this time, again, once she transitioned to a female, she stayed a female. So when I was training her as a Kumuhula, she was Wahine. But I do know that um, in the course of a few years training her, training them, you know, you get to hear of the plight of the Mahu. And, and so more so, I believe that she needed hula because hula would be, hula is a place that is still held very sacred. And if you know your hula really well and you know your rituals really well, people may not be able to see you outside of that for who you are, but in the realm of hula, they'll see that priestess in you. And I knew that she needed that fortification. 
um, it's already in the whole world. It's very critical. You, I mean, for a hula teacher to just become a self-made hula teacher, that's kind of difficult to do. It's critical. And um, and now that pe- a lot of the teachers are speaking Hawaiian, that even if you can't even speak Hawaiian, you get even now put in another category. It's just a thriving, breathing animal. Sometimes, sometimes a monster. And so I, so I corrected her. She literally gave me the signs that she was going to leave. She's going to just abort her whole journey. And I was thinking, okay, okay, what do I do? A part of my brain will say, okay, there's always going to be one person that cannot make the journey. And that's, we call that the sacrifice. They become the mohai. So I said, maybe she said, there's one that has to jump off the canoe. And it's good. So that was a part of my brain, but another part of my brain was saying, oh, freaking hell no. She cannot, she loves Hula too much. She, the gods know her too well. If I let her walk away from here without having the license, without having a ceremony, without having the Hula masters of our time in the room to certify her, this beautiful woman, she will be abused by her people because one, she's Mahu, she doesn't, she does, she's not Uniki, she's doing pagan things. I couldn't possibly send her out in the world. You never drag the horse to the water, you know, to a pool. You know, you, they have to, it's my thing, if you want to leave, leave. But for some reason, I, I went against my norm. Something told me this is the end. She, she cannot. I mean, I have people in Halau that are mahu, but she's the only wahine mahu. And she needs this fortification. I mean, she's already, she doesn't have it. Then I would have set her up for failure. So I had to really go against my rearing. And my wife said, just let her go. I said, I cannot let her go. She needs the kuahu. She can start off her own halau, but she needs the kuahu. She needs this genealogy. I'm never that passionate. I, if a student wants to leave, let the student leave. Later on, like a year later, I found out that my wife called her other cousin, Manai Kalua, who is my co-teacher and was one of Stacy's teachers. And he's also Mahu, but called Manai and said, Manai, come with me. And then they called one more person. So there were three of them that I had no clue. I did. And they went and they dragged her back. They, and Manai worked with her and he said, it's legit, he's fixing, there's something that needs to be fixed. So she could see that I wasn't just, and then the thing, she loved me as a father. You know, when you're in that world, you get criticized and critiqued inwardly, outwardly. And so she has a difficult time, or at least at one time she had a difficult time at taking um, recommendations or corrections from people that she loved. Mm-hmm. But she did love me as a father. And um, because I was that male that Mahu children wish would be their father, you know, just loving, you know, correct, I mean, you correct and you guide, but you do it from a place of love. But with her, I was really, she didn't need me, but her spirit did. And I still held my guns. I wasn't gonna, you know, and I said, you wanna leave me, you leave me after you, Nikki. You, that, you want to leave the process, do it after you, Nikki, then take all your things and throw it in the fire, because at least you finished. But do not not finish. Your spirit will always not be good with that. And she stayed. And she went through um, the process and it was a beautiful journey. And she has emerged as a, a leader. Not that she needed me, I, but I think in a way I helped pave her journey forward. And that's what Uniki does. It helps pave the journey forward for your students so that they have 
not just the support of me, but they had the support of all the hula masters that were there. And she's well respected. I mean, she has her opinions like they all do, and sometimes her opinions get voiced, and sometimes I go, oh, okay, a little tart, <laughs> a little tart. <laughs> but they're her opinions. So me inviting her I had to do, into halal, had to do with me recognizing that she was one of those people that, that relished the esoterics of being Hawaiian. I could deliver that. So she was invited. And unlike my other hula children, they don't have to deal with what she has to deal with. Mm -hmm. They have their, everyone has their struggles. Amazing, I have to be a daddy to a number of them. <laughs> but my Stacy, and again, at that time I had one, my eldest child is Mahu. And, and maybe what I couldn't do for my Mahu child, because I just wasn't mature at that time, I could do for my Mahu student. Um, and then my, my youngest boy is also Mahu. And so, you know, and growing up I was teased Mahu because I was so soft. Although I'm, I'm, I don't identify as a Mahu, but people looked at me and said, that's a Mahu. And so I know a little bit of what it feels like to be ostracized. In fact, I know a whole lot what it's like to be ostracized. Luckily for me, I could, I could blend in. She's, she's not designed to blend in. She's designed to stick out. And so my, second, my first point was her esoterics invite her in. My second point was to uh, when she was going to leave because just being susceptible and, and being just ultra sensitive. I forgot how sensitive she is. Sometimes I tend to forget that under all of that, that excellence. And so my words may, that came from somebody that she loved and trusted and that could see her finally when it came in terms of critical analysis. She kind of lost it. But luckily for my wife and her posse, we went in there and grabbed her and got her back. I didn't compromise, but I ha did have to extend an extra hand. I refused to let her abort. And I told her, you quit, you quit after you, Nikki. You throw everything in the fire and you can, and you can cross my name if you need to, but you're going to finish this. And and, and sometimes when I look at and I see on social media the stuff that she does and the respect that the community has for her, I know I have a little part in that. And then I get all emotional because she's just a beautiful human. And I think that's why a lot of my work has to do with transparency. Sometimes we just stop looking through, we just look at. And so that's my ka'au'a. And she calls me Pops. I hate it. <laughs> but she loves to call me Pops. Um, and I'm her Pops. You know, I'm the, the male in her life that believed in her and wasn't afraid to correct her. And, and was flexible enough to, um, to press the right buttons to get her back and not to abort the journey. And I really meant it. If you know you, you need to succeed. You can't. This is not. You will not walk away from this one. You'll not cover this journey up. You'll not get busy in another part of your life because this you don't want to deal with. No, no, no. The gods. You committed to the gods. Finish for the gods. You can hate me, but I knew she wouldn't. Who could hate me? <laughs>